what is the evolutionary advantage of marking time, i.e. birthdays, anniversaries of good and bad events like 9-11? Why does this and does it help us who, why do this and does it help us get our genes into the future? This is a fascinating question. Yeah. Um, you want to take it on first? Sure. Yeah. yeah I, uh, a, I think there are certain things that we mark time and it very clearly has something to do with processes that require us to do this. I'm thinking, you know, the uh, most salient example for me would be the... Um, Jewish tradition of waiting a year to put a headstone on a grave, right? Burying a person quickly and returning in a year to put the headstone. And it seems to me that this fits actually very well with the natural progress of grief, mm. that there is a one year process. There's something about being through a whole cycle without someone that, uh, you know, completes a part of that process. And that reminds me of the retombo in Madagascar, the turning of the bones ceremonies, um, in which, and it's different for, I think all of the 17-ish tribes in Madagascar do it, although certainly it's more than one. And when exactly the retombo happens relative to the harvest is different in different places. But in, in among the Bets of Masarika, which is the one to which I was invited, it's around harvest time memory serves. And so it is an annual event when um, there is a day when the bones of the ancestors are um, disinterred, are brought back up. And those who are more freshly dead, um, uh, if they have decayed entirely such that it's just bones, are they're the body boxes that they are in, effectively coffins. Um, their bones are, are cleaned, they're given new shrouds, and they're put into bone boxes. And if they were um, if they were already in bone boxes, um, then they are simply brought up. And then while they are up above ground, um, there's a ceremony in which the elder of the village, the currently living elder of the village, speaks to both the living and the dead about what has transpired in the last in the last year. Uh, and um, in that case, um, you are you are speaking to not just those who have died in the last year, and it's not an anniversary of their death, but it's an, the same moment every year, you as the living will be reminded of those who have come before and the wisdom of the ancestors. Yes, it's not, I think it's not just the wisdom of the ancestors. And in this case, um, there is something that is not well described, I think anywhere, where um, one is related through someone else, hmm. right? So, um, like in laws, yes, but I think the, the point is, um, I, I don't want to explore it too fully, but you and I are related to each other through our children, right? Oh, yeah. It's a blood relationship, even though it's not a blood relationship dyadically. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is also something then, so the addition of our children to our lineage. Uh, to what was to what is now, uh, what is a, now a our different lineage. structure, yeah. right? It is a it is a hybrid. There was no our lineage, lineage before right. Zach was born. That same process is mirrored by the absence of somebody through whom you were connected, right? And so, mm -hmm. in in I guess my point would be there is a tendency if you are um, treating your cousin well because you don't want to displease your aunt or your aunt. I don't think aunts care very much about this sort of thing, but your aunt. Uh, they love their sisters. <laughs> yes, they do. Let's say you're treating your cousin well because you love your aunt and it displeases her when you fight or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then she dies, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly your... Uh, the behavioral restrictions the, are removed. Are removed. Yeah. Unless you're going to have to explain it to her every year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Here's what happened this year. Yeah. Okay, right. We were at each other again. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, you don't want to, especially, you know, the way it's set up, it's one of these beautiful things, you know, like, uh, you know, Catholics and confession. It's set up in order to disincentivize the bad behavior. Yeah. In this case, not only are you going to have to face your aunt again and tell her that you've started fucking up now that she's gone, mm -hmm. but... Um, you're going to have to do it. it. It will be recounted in front of others. Right. And so the point is what this tends to do is stabilize our view of each other so that the loss of an individual, which is unpredictable and negative, isn't so uh, such a violent disruption of the, you know, the inter 
workings of the the tribe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I guess there's also uh, this is a little different, but we talk in the book a fair a bit about rites of passage. Yeah. And so marking time that is meaningful developmentally. Um, even if it's not all that meaningful, sort of astronomically, right? So, you know, different traditions, you might come of age at 13 in the Jewish tradition or at 15 in the Mexican tradition or, you know, at different ages. And, and in some cases, um, it's not determined by age, but sort of like, oh, there's a cohort ready. And that cohort of men who are ready to become, you know, of boys who are ready to become men or girls who are ready to become women might have an age range of 13 to 16 or something. Um, that those those are effectively marking um, marking achievement via time rather than marking time explicitly. Yeah, yeah, they're different. And actually, this is a perfect analog to the uh, little disagreement we had at the beginning of the main podcast because both kind of the. I don't remember it. We were talking about laboratory time oh, yeah. versus mm -hmm. what I was not labeling, but basically organic time. Yeah. And I'm not arguing that laboratory time didn't pre exist the, you know, creatures. It, mm -hmm. it exists. There's something that we can go back and look at. But from the point of view of an evolved creature, you ought to measure time and keep track of it in whichever way is most useful. And so if you're, you know, in the far north latitude and your days are expanding and contracting with the yeah. year, you ought to look at time very differently. Well, and you, yeah, for instance, you expect you might expect if you're a normally diurnal creature to sleep a lot more when the sun is down a lot more and to be awake a lot more in the summer. Right. And so in any case, the point is there are two very real kinds of time. And as soon as we started sticking clocks on the wall, basically one of them eclipses the other because it's right. like, well, no, what time is it really? Yeah. You know, it's 537. No, this, I mean, I was talking about this a week or two ago with regard to speed um, or, you know, maybe it was just in my natural selections piece. I think I was talking about it here too, but you know, the, you know, how it is that we understand speed, uh, you know, when you're on a bicycle or in a car with the windows down or convertible, you know, you feel the wind and you feel the cant of the road and you see how other people are interacting with you, how other cars, people are interacting with you. And, all of that is how you understand how fast you're going. <clears throat> the noise of the road of the tires on the road, depending on what the surface is, you know, or you can look at the speedometer, right? Yep. And the speedometer is the thing that the cop is going to be asking you for when he pulls you over. He's not going to be asking you for how your hair felt and you know what you were hearing in terms of the crunch of the tires. Um, but you actually have a much more embodied sense of speed with that first way of knowing. And so you know, this is just the, the temporal equivalent of that spatial thing. Like, okay, there are multiple ways, at least two yeah. ways of knowing sort of at a visceral, fully embodied level space, you know, how your physical presence in space and also in time. And there's the ways that we have come to measure these things. And we have largely replaced our understanding um, of those earlier, more complete understandings of space and time with the newer technological, simpler, less nuanced, more reductionist measures. Yeah, it's like it's adjusted for relevance, right? Tell I'll, me I'll more. give an example. Yeah. Um, if you are driving down the road in your car at 25 miles an hour, Right, maybe you're going 25 miles an hour because the guy in front of you is going 25 miles an hour, and it's a 30 mile an hour zone, and you're feeling impatient about the way you are crawling down <laughs> the road. Right, we've yep. all been there. On the other hand, if you're on your bike at 25 miles an hour, right, it's yeah. pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so, at some level, it should be exciting because it's actually perilous. Yeah, right. 25 miles an hour is enough for you to make an error that matters. You got to be fully aware of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The wind is rushing by your ears. Right. It's it's a very different phenomena to compare the two is 25 miles an hour fast yeah yes on a bike no in a car and the point is you can have a speedometer on both right but they're not comparable speeds right that's right so yeah i, I think this is this is right 